All righty then. All right. So this week in Black People Shit, benign neglect, COVID and the Black community. I'm your host, Christy Ferris. So with COVID-19 infecting every part of the United States in an overwhelming numbers, uh, African Americans specifically have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19, and many are asking why. From Atlanta to Chicago to Baltimore and Newark, Black people are the primary victim of this pandemic, causing concern and several conspiracies. Here today to discuss the casualty and conditions of this deadly virus is a John Hopkins physician and reproductive rights advocate, Dr. Reagan McDonald Mosley, as well as actress Janora McDuffie and writer Abdul Majid. But first, in the past week, Black women have been the center of attention for some great things and some concerning reasons. And I will discuss a few of them with you. So welcome, everybody. Hey, hey Christy. Hey. hey, Abdul. What up, what up, what up? Hey, nothing, nothing, nothing. Let's just go on and get started. So if you guys have not been watching uh, this Tuesday, the Academy Awards or the Academy of Television and Arts and Science releases nominations for the annual Emmy Awards. Woohoo! Woohoo! Woo yep. And in their uh, annual Emmy Awards, um, I just lost my train of thought right there. Um, Anyway, so black women are dominating the category for lead actresses in a limited series or movie. So is this change that we is this change that we've been waiting for or is just another way to appease us in the moment? Well, if I if mm -hmm. I can start because this thrills my heart. It is so wonderful and empowering to see myself reflected finally on the stage in such a such a dominant way. Yes, go black people. Yes. Um, hey, Tori Overton, by the way. Uh, Tori Overton, Little John. Um, so whether it is going to be a temporary thing or a long-term thing, only history and time will be able to tell, but I will take what I can get and celebrate this moment. So yes. I, I, I think the key, however, isn't just we see ourselves finally this is an amazing moment for it to continue it doesn't mean that we need to recognize these actors and actresses of color it means we need to continue to have the roles for the actors and actresses of color so they can be recognized so they can be multi-dimensional characters that are reflective of the human experience that we get to show on on the screen so right. uh, yes right. to us and for it to continue, we need the people in the positions to to continue those roles as writers, as showrunners, as all of these things that make up the matrix of the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. Well, and how about you, Abdul? I, I think it's a bit of both. I think the pandering happens. It happens after the uh, Oscar so white. You remember the season after that, they had a bunch of black people or a few black people. I think it's a bit of pandering. I think it'll be sustained. Uh, not exactly how Janora said it. I do believe that the writers have always been there. I think the actors have always been there. I think the directors have always been there. I think the demand from the public, the demand from the people who are pushing the agenda, I think they're the ones who cause this to happen. So the ripple effect of the social injustice and, the, and all the things that are happening and people standing up and saying more about uh, the plight of black people in this country. So I do think that uh, if, the, if the people continue to push, I think we will continue to this to be something sustainable. My only concern is that on the television side, it seems like now uh, the media who was covering all of the stuff, which caused all of this other stuff to happen, are starting to veer away from it and talk about other things. So I think if they tend to keep, uh, continue to do that and can continue to sort of uh, want to say, change the subject and we don't force them to change it back, we might go back to what it was before. Right, right. And so, um, from my experience and what I remember, uh, because, um, you know, I, I was a part of the daytime Emmys and I remember, you know, 20 years ago or something when I was an intern on Young and the Restless, one of the things that they were saying, and also when I was on Passions, one of the things that a lot of people told me, whether it's true or not, but um, a lot of people are voting for their own show. 
So if you don't have people in the academy, daytime or primetime Emmys that are able to vote, then there's a good chance you're probably not going to be able to get up there. So for instance, Young and the Restless has like 20,000 actors on their show. So that's a part of the reason why they're always being nominated besides the fact that the actors are good. So if you have a young show that doesn't have a whole bunch of people in the academy, then you might get stuck. I think that's one of the things that keeps us from getting voted in. And I think the other thing that keeps us from getting voted in, well, I won't say what keeps us, what has helped was that the Academy added a whole bunch of people of color into the Academy this year. So, uh, so that's another, that's another Avenue, but I'm saying congratulations all around and I'm so yeah. super excited about it. So, I also think, uh, thinking, uh, streaming services, Mm -hmm. are going to affect the things because uh, that they're younger and they're more diverse group of people who who watch streaming services and watch different shows on mm -hmm. streaming services. And I think if they have any say so, diversity is really a thing for the uh, for young for the younger population. Right. All right. So on Sunday, rest in peace, this incredible oh. man, John Lewis was taken across the Edmund Pettus Bridge for a final time in a tribute to memorialize the late congressman's participation in the 1965 pro protest known as Bloody Sunday. Also this week, several black high profile black women such as Susan Rice, Kamala Harris, Karen Bass, Stacey Abrams, and a few more were named as possible VP vice presidential nominees in this year's election. So being that John Lewis was such an advocate for voters' rights and voter participation, do you think that Black people will now come out even more now that we might have a Black vice presidential candidate? Thoughts? I sure hope so. <laughs> I mean, we're even outside of having all of this black girl magic as potential vice presidential candidates, mm -hmm. just John Lewis's life alone is a testament to, to us needing to vote. And how do we honor him by following through and voting? I know people talked about uh, changing the name of the bridge to honor him or changing the name of the Voting Rights Act that's currently on the table to his name. He was like, nah, what you need to do, you need to vote. You need right. to pass that bill and you need to vote. So I just hope that we honor it first and foremost for not just John Lewis, but others who have lost their lives mm -hmm. and fought for us to have that right. And in terms of the vice presidential picks, it's still not guaranteed that Joe is gonna go with a sister. Um, so that's yet to be told. Now, granted, that's the tricky part because who wants another four years of that orange asshole that's in office, <laughs> right? So that would be vote for Biden, but I don't want him to take that for granted and skip over having uh, a black woman as his running mate. But uh, that's what we do as black people. We, we just, we love, we're forgiving. We don't necessarily demand something in exchange for our vote. I feel like a lot of times our vote has been taken for granted. Um, we get somebody somewhere and then they forget about us. So it'll be very interesting. I am dying to know who he chooses. For me, any, meeny, miny, mo. all those black women are just dynamic and, and just excellence in every right. sense of the word. Of course, there's some that have more pros than others, depending on how you want to slice what's important. Uh, but I am I am on pins and needles to find out who he's going to yeah, choose. I can't and wait. yes, no matter who, I, I he will have my vote, but I just don't want him to take that for granted. And I want Black people to still show up, regardless of who he chooses, uh, for the simple fact of honoring the legacy of John Lewis and other civil rights activists. Right. How about you, Abdul? I don't know if more black people will show up just for the simple fact that with the uh, aggressive voter suppression that we have and the frustration mm -hmm. people black people have and everything that's going on with mail-in ballots and everything that's going on with them uh, condensing the amount of places that you can vote at and with Corona and all this just like this hurricane and storm of just nonsense. I'm not sure if black people, I'm hopeful uh, let me say that I'm hopeful, but I'm not convinced 
that black people will stay there, especially for the candidate that we have now. Like when all the stuff was going on with um with uh, President Barack Obama and them attempting to do similar things, black people did it because they were so invested in Obama and, and his presidency. They were invested in the fact that they were going to have the first black president. People aren't too invested with uh with Biden. Actually, a lot of people don't like Biden. I think his uh his his, uh, his history with black people was in terms of uh his mass incarceration bill and 94 crime bill and uh, things of that nature, I think have turned a lot of people off with regards to the vice president. Uh, I'm almost, I, I think it's like 99% that they're going to get a sister in there. My only concern with the pool is that they all pull from the same well. Mm-hmm. They all, I am, if it was up to, if I had my druthers, I said, I like Nina Turner. Who was uh who was the chairperson for Biden? I mean for uh, for uh, Bernie Sanders. I think she can get the same pull from the same pool that all these other sisters pull from, but she can also pull from the Biden from the uh, Bernie pool, who right. are on the fence, and a lot of them may sit out. I think that's that is attractive to me in terms of a, can- a candidate. And plus, she's smart and a bunch of other things. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting, and I'm just wondering if people actually know. Who these candidates are if they're paying attention yeah. you know i mean everybody knows about biden but are they paying attention to all these incredible women who are out there that are strong every last one of them are strong um i have a hard time though with kamala because after uh, abdul you told me that she was arresting all them parents who had their kids being truant sure uh, she law. yeah that that right there really kind of because i thought about it i was thinking about it actually earlier today and i was thinking all those times that my brother ditched school if they had put my mom in jail for my brother ditching school we would probably be homeless you know what i mean so it just made me think about it and for all of you guys who don't know uh what's the truant law you want to give a better explanation of it the truant law was was a law when she was a uh, attorney general for california it was placing parents uh now there were there wasn't a felony but they were arresting parents if their children had unexcused absence over a certain amount of times in uh in in northern california i believe it was and then she set up this whole operation sting operation where the news camera came and they came to this woman's home and arrested her and it was a black woman they did it to and the overall number of the people who uh they were arresting were were, uh were, were black people yeah, and then, see, it, and then I, it was a whole other thing with the with the firemen that fire they wanted the fire a lot of ex cons they were using as firemen to prevent a lot of these forest fires, and they wanted to get them pay and some other stuff and help them out in different ways and she was opposed to it and it was just yeah. it was just a, it's just a, it's just a mess with her she has a lot of baggage with her so I'm not you know she might be smart but I'm not a fan I don't, I don't and not to cut you off and I don't want to extend this but no go ahead. I think I, I think a lot of black people now are looking for a female black candidate who will advocate for them and have a black agenda. And everything that I've heard her say and everything I've read about her, she doesn't make those distinctions. There's no such thing about the black agenda. She'll use the fact that she's in a sorority to prove she's black. She'll use the fact that she'll went to Howard to prove that she's black. When you come to her and ask her the bottom line, what are your bread and butter issues with regards to black people? There are none. And she said it on, on on this. She said it in several interviews about the fact that she doesn't see a distinction between the two. It's 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 the, it's the all lives matter uh, approach that she takes. So yeah, yeah. Well, if uh, I could just say one quick thing. Sure. Kamala never said anything about all lives matter. I know you're just making the analogy. And yes. No. I and I only speak up because I have met the sister personally and she has only been loving and kind and, and just again, exuding excellence. So um, I hear your point all day, Abdul, but I just wanted to uh, give her a plug of just being a kind human every time that I have had the chance to interact with her. I think- Which I counts think for that, something. I think that George W. Bush was entertaining and funny and he loved Michelle Obama, but I do not trust his policies whatsoever. And I think uh, what's to next, Christy? Black what's black. next? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, on Instagram, uh, so the hashtag protect black women has been prevalent with over like 46,000 posts and even more comments. 
So this week, Kyrie Irving committed $1.5 million in an effort to support the uh, WNBA women who are foregoing the season in an effort to support social change. And then a guy named Anthony Heron Jr. decided to do a protective detail on Jennifer McLegan's home in Long Island after being threatened by her neighbors after police refused to intervene. And then, of course, we have several armed black men faced off against a neo-Nazi group in Louis, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, after demanding justice in the Breonna Taylor murder. So is this the new wave of social reform? What are your thoughts? Well, uh, for me, I think that uh, it's not necessarily anything new. I think it's going back to the old, the old idea of taking care of community and having a village and looking after each other. And I would love to see it continue. Now, granted, the militia might be pushing it for me personally, right, but I understand right. the concept. Right. And, and, and maybe you can think of it in a way of we had Dr. King's voice, but we also needed a Malcolm X voice, right? So so, so a balance of just ways to go about solving a, a systematic problem. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Kyrie Irving, let's do more of that. I mean, think about how many black yes. entertainers and sports figures, and if you brought together their income, a, a, a fraction of their income, and they've given it back to the community or supporting women, uh, I, I think that that can change the system, change lives, change the world. And I'm, again, I'm not telling people how to spend their money, but what power to, to be able to do that, to change the world. And so I would love to make it popular again, not how many houses you got, cars, you got boats, you got because they could still get that and still have some left over, but mm -hmm. make it cool to give back, to find that cause that speaks to you and to put your money where your mouth is, give it back to the community. And then also uh, pull your money together, find a way to trust each other again. Mm. Cause I, I think that was a point that was brought up at an earlier episode. Why can't we have our own black banks? If, if some of these people who have right. all this money just right. pull together and trust people, we don't need them to ask and, and beg a system that's already against wanting to give black folks loans like we can we can do it ourselves so yes to Kyrie I would love to see more of that and I would love to see the media cover more of that so instead of us getting shot and whatever not that that's not important but it's equally important to show the good as well yeah. so go ahead Kyrie you know they don't show the good all the time go ahead Abdul <laughs> uh they're not a militia if they were white they'd be a gun club so we're going to call them a black gun club I that's do think fair. that uh more black people need to uh, have legal firearms. I think it would change a lot of things in our system, but especially the way that we're approached and the way we're attacked by not the police, but other than the police. Uh, I think Brother's been doing things like the gentleman did in Long Island for a really long time. You look in Brooklyn, maybe a couple years ago when, uh, when the sister got attacked at the hair salon, they boycotted the hair salon, uh, the, nail, the nail place in order for uh, to get some sort of recompense for what they did to her. Uh, and I'm all for Kyrie and any brother and sister putting our resources together to help each other out. I do think that for a while, maybe socially, black men and black women have been out of sync with regards to, I don't know, a lot of things. In, uh, I just think we've been out of sync. We've been out of sync. We haven't seen eye to eye on many topics with uh, children and a lot of things that are going on. So I hope this is uh, away. Oh, I think we're, I think we're losing you a little bit. Is it like that for you, Janor? Where we're losing Abdul? Um, I I always hear Abdul loud and clear. Oh, maybe okay. even when he slows maybe down, I hear him because he's always okay. just Finish. speaking Finish. the truth. I think you're back, Abdul. No, I'm just saying I that black people been out of black men and women have been out of sync for a long time, and I hope that things like this will cause us give, will give us more healing. That's all. Mm. Well. Well, with the healing process, we are now going to dive into this whole corona because there's so much going on. And I think we don't know. I have um, I had a couple of friends that died this week that, or that had family members that died this week of corona. So um, in our main topic, benign neglect is defined as non-interference that is intended to benefit someone or something else. 
As COVID-19 has seemingly targeted the black community, many have questions as to the factual and fictional nature of this virus. So from vaccination con uh, conspiracy theories to the underlying conditions that led that lead blacks to being more susceptible to the virus. So what is real and what is fake about the coronavirus? I'm honored to have with us Dr. Reagan McDonald Mosley, a graduate from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and the New York University Medical Center. Dr. Reagan has been recently named on Ebony Magazine's Power 100 list for her support of rep uh, reproductive rights and her relentless drive to create healthy, uh, sorry, to create health equality in the United States. So Reagan, Dr. Reagan, we would like to have you on the show and thank you. Hold on, let me bring you in here. There you go. Hi, Reagan, Dr. Reagan. Hi. Thanks for having yeah. me. Absolutely. We got to call you Dr. Reagan because we want everybody to know you out here doing some real big things over here, taking care of people, making sure we're surviving. So uh, thank you for, for coming on the show and thank Janora for uh, bringing you on. I know you guys are really good friends. So let's just dive into this whole Corona thing. Um, my first question that I have, uh oh, we got somebody saying Dr. Reagan is the truth. Uh, so <laughs> I want to ask you the very the thing that is the most um, pressing is the um, the vaccine that's supposed to be coming out. Well, one of the things that we keep hearing is that they want to try to put it in the black community first because we're dying off a little bit faster. Um, but then we also have the conspiracy side, which is no, they want to give it to the black community first because they want to see if you're gonna die from it and then try to fix it and give it to the other people. So my question is, what is the truth? And do you think that the vaccine should go to the black community first? Do you think that we should let the trials happen first? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you for that question. And thank you again so much, each of you, for having me on the show to talk about this important topic. And let me just say, Chrissy, I'm so sorry for your loss. So many of us in the community right now are suffering losses from the coronavirus um, and this pandemic because it is disproportionately impacting communities of color and specifically the black community. Mm -hmm. um, so the vaccine, right? We don't have a vaccine yet, but they are um, they're researching the vaccine. In fact, I'm aware of two institutions right here in Baltimore City where I live, University of Maryland and John Hopkins right up the street. They both have vaccine trials going on right now. Um, and I believe they're hoping to have a vaccine that's ready for the market um, sometime early in 2021, right? Mm -hmm. Now that is a lot faster than vaccine development has ever been done in the history of vaccine development. And the fact that it's happening so quickly is giving a lot of people pause, which I think makes sense, right? Um, but underlying that also is sort of like this racial dynamic that you mentioned. The reality is you do want the vaccine to go to the populations that are most affected by any disease, right? Because that's where it's going to have the most impact. But it's essential that we make sure that the vaccine is safe, that it's effective before we disseminate it out to the population. And it's going to be critically important with this coronavirus vaccine because there is so much mistrust of the medical system in general in the Black community for good reason because of the history of experimentation on black bodies. It's very important to make sure that the vaccine is safe and effective before we start distributing it in our community. Uh, I, got, I got a question. Uh, uh, do you know, like the flu keeps mutating every year, so every year we have to get a different shot, we have a different strand every year. Will, will the coronavirus continue to mutate? And if so, will we have to get a new vaccine every year like the flu? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a very astute question. That's right. So every year the flu vaccine mutates and really some scientists get in a room and they try to make some evidence-based decisions about what the vaccine should um, contain for that year. But those at the end of the day are just guesses, right? Thus far, what we know about the coronavirus is there haven't been any major mutations that are clinically significant. Um, the virus replicates rapidly. Every time it infects someone, it basically just takes over their body and the human's body becomes just a virus replication factory, right? So it's putting out so much virus that and replicating so rapidly that mutations are gonna happen. Mutations are happening every day with the coronavirus. 
But so far, from what we know, there aren't any major, major significant mutations that would require different vaccine formulations. But that doesn't mean between now and when the vaccine is available that that won't happen. That's a really good question. And what about this African doctor lady, Emmanuel, and this whole hydrochloroquine conversation? It's out there and it's taken down, but it's and taken it's down by the pharma. Like what, what is real in that whole soap opera? Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, that's a really interesting um, dynamic, right? And part of what's so different about how this pandemic is spreading in our country versus other countries is that we just have so much misinformation and mistrust of the media, mistrust of the medical system. And so people just don't know what to believe, right? Um, so, and then you overlay that with the fact that we actually just don't know everything about this virus. We don't yet know if it will mutate. To, to the questions. We don't yet know if there's going to be an effective safe vaccine. Um, you know, at, at one point, the Surgeon General was saying, don't wear masks. And then a few months later, he was saying, everyone wear masks. And so I think this right. flip flopping and the level of uh, lack of information is a problem. But this disinformation and spreading deliberately um, of information that we know is not true is a real, real problem. Um, and it's happening in a lot of media contexts and it's dangerous. It's frankly dangerous because if you're telling people you don't need to social distance, you don't wear masks, that, those are some of the only tools that we have right now to fight this virus. Um, so it's really important that we are promoting in, um, evidence-based um, information and that we are um, pushing back misinformation where we can. So I've seen, I've seen a couple of, um, just like news, people talking about how they got the coronavirus, either they were asymptomatic or maybe they had it for a little while, um, went away, thought they were fine, but they're starting to have like heart issues and lung issues. And so it seems like it's affecting more than what we know than just having a flu-like symptom, so to speak. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and what we might know um, of the, the long lasting damage that some people yeah, are that's getting? A, that's a great question, Christy. So this, you know, I would put this question in the category of the things that we don't yet know about the coronavirus, right? So we know that typically it's spread from respiratory droplets. So usually it spreads from person to person, from breathing in the air from someone else who was infected, who may or may not have symptoms. And then once the virus infects your body, usually the initial symptoms are respiratory related, something like fever, cough, shortness of breath, but there are a whole host of other symptoms that can be related to the coronavirus. And what we're also learning is that it seems to also impact the vessels in our bodies and can cause a lot of clotting. And so people are presenting with things like stroke and pulmonary embolism and things like that that are actually caused from the coronavirus. And then lastly, what you said is exactly right. We're learning that even after people recover from sort of the acute virus and the acute phase, that there can be longstanding issues. Um, there was one study that just came out that showed that 30% of young people who had the coronavirus have evidence of lung damage, even after they feel fine and are fully recovered. If you, take their, if you look at their x-rays, there's evidence of lung damage. So we don't know the long-term effects of this virus. I saw one study that linked the virus with potentially um, infertility in males. Um, but you know, the veracity of these findings, I think we'll have to wait and see until we are able to do longer term longitudinal studies to really see the full impact in the community. Right, right, right. Um, uh, Tim, gotta, so, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, you got no, 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 I was going to ask the question. Yep, go ahead. Go for it. Oh, um, we're, we're seeing, Tim says, we're seeing a major spike in the summer months, which con contradicts the initial idea that heat would diminish the effect. What's gonna happen this winter? Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, typically with the flu, right, which is another respiratory virus that we have a lot of experience with, the flu tends to go down in the summer months because the um, humidity in the air and the heat sort of remove some of that from the air and it doesn't travel as far. Um, and so there was some speculation that that might also be the case with the coronavirus, but clearly that's not the case, right? Right now, we're huge surges in the virus in areas that are very warm in Florida, and Texas and California. Um, so the fear is that when the winter months come and people are also you know, battling with the flu and common other colds, 
um, that the coronavirus can spread even further. Uh, so it's really important that each of us do everything that we can right now to protect ourselves, to protect our loved ones, to protect our communities. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. It requires a great deal of sacrifice, but I hope everyone's having some meaningful conversations within their own households about their rules. What is safe? What do we allow? What don't we allow? Where can we go? Where can we not go? What's essential and what's not, right? What can we avoid doing? Um, and the more that you limit your activity, the more that you're limiting your potential exposure to this virus. So being that you said uh, you should uh, regulate uh, or limit your exposure to the virus, what are your thoughts on children going back to school? Oh, you're just giving me all the hard questions now. So I'll say, you know, I am not an educator, although I do educate medical students and residents. Um, and I will say that this is a really hard topic, you know, and, there, and I don't know that there is a right answer here. Uh, because we do know that it's really, really important for children to be in school environments and that they thrive with in-person school environments, especially kids who have special needs um, or for whom online learning is just not a great option, right? We know that. But we also know that by bringing people into spaces where they're going to be inside around a lot of people, we're putting them at risk. So I, don't, I can't say, you know, what is right for other people's families. I think that each family is going to have to decide for themselves if their school system gives them the option, what's best for them. And then I hope that they just, you know, uh, come to peace with that decision because in either case, there are gonna be sacrifices. There are gonna be risks and benefits on both sides. Um, and if you feel like for your child, it's really, really important that they go to school, then at that point, you just have to do what you can to make that safer, right? So at that point, it's risk mitigation. So it's important that the student wears a mask, that they understand how to wash their hands, um, it's important that the school itself has sort of environmental controls and engineering to limit the spread of the virus. Um, so it's a harm reduction and sort of risk reduction at that point, right? And if you feel like, you know, it's better for my child to stay home because maybe they have medical problems or there are other people in that house who have medical problems and it's not worth the risk, then you just have to do your best and what you can to make sure that that student is getting the information that they need. But it's not an easy decision. I have two young kids of my own, and it's something that I'm struggling with, even with having all of the information about the virus that I have. Wow. I know it's uh, especially tricky for kids who live in intergenerational homes. Uh, but why, at the end of the day, and I know that we haven't gotten to this part of the conversation yet, why is it affecting black folks more, people of color yes. more? Why, if, if I go home to my black grandma, it's more of a chance that she'll die over um, Becky Sue, yep. and Becky Sue, white Becky Sue. Because Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question. Becky Sue. I'm so glad you asked that question, it's super important. And actually one, one of the things that you just said is, is one of the reasons, right? Is that people of color and black people specifically are more likely to live in multi-generational households compared to white people, right? Um, and so the people who are most at risk for having a very bad course of this virus and the people most at risk for dying are people who are 70 and 80 years old. Um, the risk of someone who's young dying is very small, you know, in general, less than 1%. But someone who's 70 or 80 years old may have a 30 to 40% chance of dying from this virus. So that's a huge difference, right? And so if you live in a multi-generational household, um, that can put the older people at risk, right? I'm sorry, I, I, I just want to jump in because I want to clarify when you say younger, what is the age younger? Because some people who are in their 30s and 40s think they're young. When you say younger, are you talking about, you know, 12, 20, you know what I mean? Can you just clarify yeah, so, that so that people know? Thank you for that. Yeah. So people who are, you know, less than 10 years old have a far less than 1% chance of dying from the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. People in the, the sort of 10 to 20 year old range, it's still very low. Um, but probably a little bit over 1%. And then it sort of increases from there. And then there's an exponential increase when you get to that 60, 70, 80 year old range, such that the death rates are closer to 30, 40% and higher. Mm -hmm. um, so why are black people affected more from the coronavirus? It's really important, I think, for us to understand this. Um, and I think of this in three layers, right? So one thing is just this virus itself is like super savvy, right? It's a very slick virus. It's not so deadly like the Ebola virus that like can spread it because they get it and die too quickly, but it's very, very, um, it's very, very transmissible um, just from doing social things. And we're social, you know, we're social beings. We like to hang out. We like to go have drinks. 
Um, and so that's how the virus spreads. We like to go to church and sing in the choir and that's how the virus spreads. So that's one layer is just sort of the virus itself and the natural history and the nature of the virus that makes this. And that's the case for everyone. That's not particular to black people, right? But then you, you dive down a layer to the next layer and you think of sort of the social characteristics of how we live and work and move in the world, right? And what's particular to black people. We are more likely to be essential workers, right? Because of the systems of systemic racism, lack of opportunity um, and segregation um, historically in our, in our nation, right? So when you think of the um, sanitation workers, the medical assistants working in nursing homes and hospitals, the bus drivers, um, these are people who are continuing to have to leave their home and put themselves at risk every day and potentially being exposed to the coronavirus much higher than people who have, you know, the types of jobs where they can work from home and sit in front of their computer all day, right? right. Um, moreover, for because of the same systems of systemic racism and segregation, Black people are more likely to live in less healthy environments, environments with pollution, environments with less and options for exercise, environments with less access to healthy food, right? And all of those things impact our baseline health situation and therefore our ability to fight the disease, right? And then the third layer is the healthcare system itself, which unfortunately we know historically treats people differently based on who they are and based on their race and ethnicity, right? Um, there was a bit of investigative journalism that was just uh, put out by the New York Times looking at this discrepancy in New York specifically, right? And the differences between the public hospital systems, which are much more likely to treat low-income people and people of color, and the private hospital systems that treat people with commercial insurance, and the people who were admitted to the public hospitals with the coronavirus were three to four times more likely to die than the people who were admitted to the private hospitals, right? Mm -hmm. So the healthcare system itself is treating people differently and racism is rooted into the structures of our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. um, so you layer on this very slick virus that's sort of designed to spread and then a layer of segregation and historic racism, right? That sort of affects our baseline health and where we live right. and work and the fact that we're more likely to be essential workers and, we're every day. and then the differential treatment by the healthcare system itself. And unfortunately it's the perfect storm for the situation we're seeing where black people in some situations are two to three times more likely to die from the coronavirus than white people. So is this true? Is it not true? Do we need to do it? Do we not need to do it? Um, when we go to the grocery store, do we need to wipe down every single thing that we bought? That's the first one. And then I have another one after that. Yeah. So thank you for asking that. I have to admit, you know, just even as I've been like studying this and reading every paper that comes out and all, all of these like Facebook pages with other doctors, right? And even my behavior has changed over the last six months, such that, you know, before when I would go to the grocery store, I would take sandy wipes and wipe everything down. And if I would order takeout, I would wipe everything down. But it seems like the research is showing that the primary way, not the only way, but the primary way that this virus is spreading is through respiratory droplets. So really the most important thing that we can all do is limit the amount of indoor time we have with other people who are not in our immediate household, right? Okay. Wow. Um, and then if you can't limit that amount of time that you're in, in indoor spaces, then wear a mask and try to stay at least six feet apart and, and further if you can, right? Um, I think another question is like, do we need to wear masks outside? I don't know that we know the answer to that. And so I think, you know, if you can, it's certainly safer to do so uh, if you can't because you're running or doing strenuous activities or um, then just try to keep yourself as far away from other people as possible. But certainly what we do know is that, again, if you're inside and breathing air that other people have um, have taken into their lungs and and ex and uh, put out, that you really want to be wearing a mask. And, it, and it, it, it necessitates that everyone is wearing a mask. Right. So if I'm wearing a mask, but you're not wearing a mask then you're not protecting me and vice versa. And so it necessitates that everyone is wearing a mask and keeping their respiratory droplets to themselves. Um, so in my, my role, you know, being sort of like the, the mask police in my, in my health centers, um, I've been telling people like spread love, not germs. You know, that's, right. that's what we're doing, supporting <laughs> right. one another in this very challenging time. Um, and part of that is protecting one another by wearing a mask. So your mask is to protect those around you. 
Okay, I know someone has a question there. Uh, let me ask this one real quick. Uh, actually, we'll go to this one. What safety protocols can we follow if we have to fly? Yeah, yeah, that's a great one. So avoid flying if you can, uh, honestly, <laughs> in this time. If you can't, just be very deliberate to do sort of the things that we've discussed. Wear a mask at all times. Um, stay away from other people. You don't want to sort of like crowd people in line. Stay away from people as much as possible. Bring some wipes, some cleansing wipes, so that when you get to your seat, wipe down the hard surfaces of your seat. Um, I've seen some um, uh, experts that recommend turning the airflow on, right? Because sort of anything that could potentially push clouds of virus away from your mouth may be helpful. Um, in addition, um, if you can, choose a window seat away from the bathroom so that, that you're not close to the traffic going to and from the bathroom. So this is, again, this is not like scientific, well-studied, right, <laughs> advice. Right. This is sort of medical expert advice, but it kind of makes sense based on what we know about the virus to date. Okay. I, I know everybody wants to ask a question, but let me, let me finish the second one. So do we, since you're talking about the droplets, you know, falling or spreading, does that mean it could fall into our clothes? Because do we need to, as soon as we walk in the door, take off our clothes? I mean, I know people, as soon as they walk in the door, they're taking off the clothes and throwing them in the washing machine. Yeah. Is that something that we need to do as well? Yeah, I think it makes sense too. You know, again, and, and just thinking about risk mitigation and trying to do what you can, if it's feasible to, that does make sense. So I work in the health center seeing patients a couple of days a week. I keep a mask on the entire time I'm in the health center. Um, I don't wear the same shoes in the health center that I, that I bring home and I, um, wear scrubs in the health center and wear street clothes home. As soon as I get home, I, um, go and I change out of the clothes that I had in the health center, uh, put my mask in the wash. And, um, yeah, so these are just things that you can do to make sure that you're decreasing the potential of bringing virus into your house. Um, and, you know, it could be that there's virus on your on your bag or in, on your clothes or in your hair, um, but oftentimes that virus will not live very long, right? So again, the, the real risk is the live virus that's in the air. If you're breathing it in and breathing it in for a long time, that's the real, the, the highest risk, I should say. Um, so what you want to do is try to avoid those scenarios as much as possible, but certainly taking other precautions makes sense as well. Mm. Yes, I have a question. So uh, our country has a history of, of, of experimenting on black people. Yes. With, you know, the Tuskegee experiment, you got the uh, eugenics program, drugs in the 80s and, and 70s. So for a person who would, be, would classify as a conspiracy theorist like myself, when the first batch of vaccination comes out, would you take it or would you suggest it to your patients? Wow. You know, this is actually something that I've been thinking a lot about because th this is a very real scenario. Again, they're doing two vaccine trials right here in Baltimore. Um, and some of these these um, institutions, medical institutions are reaching out to us um, to to partner. And because of the history of experimentation on people of color in our nation, and because of the populations that I work with, which are mostly people of color, mostly people who live with low incomes, um, it is essential that we make sure that these, these vaccines are safe and effective before um, we give them to the people that I live and work with and know and love, right? Um, so I share your skepticism, frankly, um, but I think that it's really important that we give it a chance because if, if, if we want to see the world returned to normal or some sense of normalcy, the best bet is for a safe, effective vaccine. So I think that your skepticism is warranted based on the history of medical research and experimentation, specifically on low-income people and people of color in our nation. Um, but I think that we should wait and see what the, what the data shows. Um, and so that's my non-answer to your question, because I don't know yet, to be honest. I really have to wait and see what the research shows, how robust it is, how many people they tested it on. Um, I can tell you probably I would not be first in line, um, but I would I would like to think I would be an early adopter if the data looks good. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Janora. Did you um, have something? Because otherwise I, I, I'm a I, 
I, well, I always have something, but I definitely wanted to honor the people who are checking yes. in live Perfect. and asking That's questions. I so I will, uh, yeah, toss it to them. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you can read off. Uh, let's go with, um, ah, I like to read off. Wait, we just did Tim. <laughs> there, uh, there, there we go. Do you have that it, one? It, that's you see a, some? actually a, a statement, which I fully uh, oh, second and third. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we can, um, okay, there we go. There's one up top that says, uh, can you can you touch on catching COVID through your eyes? Yes, yeah. that's the one I was yes. looking for. Yeah, yes, so probably. Um, in fact, the CDC has now changed the recommendations for personal protective equipment in the healthcare settings to say that Healthcare workers should wear masks and eye protection when um, seeing patients because it is possible that the respiratory droplets could enter your mucosal surface around your eyes, your conjunctiva, and infect you that way. It's less likely than through the, the, your lungs, but it is possible. Um, and so, you know, you might see people wearing those like really funky looking visors and things. Um, that is an option, you know, if you want to make sure that your eyes are protected in addition to wearing a mask. Um, is it okay if I take this question about wearing gloves as well? Because yes, this one yes. drives me nuts as a healthcare provider when I see Absolutely. people like in the grocery store with their gloves on. So, um, you know, gloves are appropriate for certain settings, right? Like if you're serving food or you're a healthcare provider and you're going to change your gloves in between every single patient or every single mm -hmm. transaction. But it's totally not effective and in fact probably is doing more harm by spreading the virus. If you're walking around the store and touching everything and touching your face and fixing your mask, and then um, and you keep the same gloves on, right? It's actually much better to not wear gloves and to use hand sanitizer um, as you're sort of touching different things if you need to. So don't wear the gloves, but do keep some hand sanitizer on you and use that to cleanse your hands um, in between moving around stores. How often should you, uh, how often should you wash your mask? Every day, so, and, or really, times a day if you're out in public. So I tend to keep a couple of, of just like face, um, cloth face masks on me. Um, and whenever you're out in public, right? Or if you're outside, potentially if you're talking to someone or past someone or just walking around, there could be um, a cloud of, um, that contains respiratory droplets that you walk through. And now instead of going into your lungs, that is sitting on your mask. So it's really important that you want to try not to touch the mask I see people wearing their masks like below their nose with their nose sticking out or on their chins or like half off. It's not effective in any of those ways. So you really wanna make sure that it's fully covering your nose and your mouth and that you're not fiddling with the front of your mask because that's the part that's gonna have the most virus load on it. When you take it off, you wanna sort of just gently peel it behind the ears if it's in, uh, one with ear flaps or untie it, but try not to touch the front of the surface. And then once you have it off, you wanna fold the mask in on itself so that the contaminated part is folded in on itself, then throw it in the wash, just wash it, you know, regular um, detergent that you use. It should be adequate to get rid of the virus, um, but you don't want to keep wearing the same dirty mask because that could actually put you more at risk. Oh my gosh. Oh. I think I've been doing it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good though. Uh, someone asked that? Someone asks, is it taking uh, hydrochloroquine a placebo or is there benefits to it? It's a great question. So, you know, there were some studies looking at giving chloroquine or different forms of chloroquine to very sick people um, who were mostly like in the ICU settings or in the hospital. Um, and the preliminary studies did not show that it was super effective. Um, but I think there's additional research. There have been a few studies that showed that it was, but the initial studies that sort of allowed the FDA to put it on the list of approved medications for the coronavirus did not prove to be affected, uh, effective rather. So then it was removed from the list of medications approved by the FDA for the coronavirus. Um, so I think this goes in the category of things that we don't quite yet know, but it seems like the preliminary studies did not show that it was effective. Um, and I don't know that there's any evidence to suggest that sort of like taking it prophylactically is a benefit and it's a medication that can cause significant harm if not taken correctly or taken in, in large doses. Um, so people need to be very careful and please consult your medical provider um, before st starting something like that. So to so, answer uh, Don's question, uh, the African doctor Trump tweeted uh, obviously what she was saying 
has been proven wrong. <laughs> so if you didn't, you didn't get a chance, Don, you didn't get a chance to see it a little bit earlier, but we did discuss it. We did bring it up. And, you know, it, from my perspective, I just think that it is false news. So that's my perspective on it. Uh, well, then maybe, a, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Oh, well, maybe a follow-up to that. And hey, Don, yep, watch the replay. Uh, Reagan, Dr. Reagan goes in on that. A follow up to that though is why? Why do we have such misinformation out there? What is the benefit of, of 50 different stories about this one problem that I feel like can be solved? If we all listen to you, Dr. Reagan, on this program right now, wh what's the benefit of like all this craziness going on behind the scenes? Yeah, uh, well, I certainly do not have all the answers. I am really grateful again for you inviting me on here to share what I do know um, and what I have been able to study and learn. Um, why there is so much misinformation. I mean, I think this is not only true to this case of the coronavirus, right? I mean, if you go on YouTube right now, you can find a million different crazy opinions about anything. So think of something outside of the coronavirus that you strongly believe in and you, you know, know and love and think, you know, is, is just the truth with a capital T. You can find, you know, probably a million videos on YouTube that completely refute your truth, right? Um, and this is just a part of our culture, unfortunately. There was a study done last year that sort of was evaluating um, across the globe um, education levels for students. And one of, I think, the most disconcerting things to me, right, it was sort of, of course, it had like math levels were discrepant or reading levels were discrepant, but that's something that we could fix. But the most disconcerting thing to me was it showed that American students were far less to decipher um, an opinion from a fact than students from other countries, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. And so we have a significant lack of ability to critically think and to evaluate when someone tells us something, whether or not something is true or not. So this is work that I'm actively doing with my own children. I have a 14 year old who likes to debate me about, um, d about Donald Trump all the time and um, <laughs> what's true and what's not true. Um, and so I can't tell him what to believe, but I can show him how to become a critical thinker. And that's what we really need to be doing um, and doing that work in our communities and with our children. So we're going to take this last question, which is, are any mask better than the others or are we OK with a face covering, whether it be a piece of cloth or medical mask, et cetera? Good question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so any mask is better than no mask, but yes, there are differences in the amount of protection that's provided. Mm -hmm. So the best mask or the gold standard for sort of keeping out respiratory droplets from entering into your mouth would be the high level medical mask called an N95 mask, which reduces 95% of the particles from coming in. Um, those are expensive and hard to come by. Um, and you know, we're really trying to save those for the medical providers who are dealing with sick patients who have the coronavirus. Um, but that is sort of like the, the best mask in terms of removing or eliminating particles from getting into your mouth. Um, next to that or, or underneath that would be just sort of like a general surgical mask, what you think of when you watch television and you see the blue surgical masks. Um, they're made out of multiple layers of filtered paper that are pretty thin and they're still pretty comfortable. Um, and then there are a number of studies that have looked at different types of material um, that you can find online. Maybe we can disseminate, post them to your website and disseminate them afterwards that sort of have different types of material listed by their efficacy. Um, but the bottom line is anything is better than nothing. And um, if we all wear masks um, for the next four weeks, we could make a huge impact in the transmission of this virus. Right. Wow. Um... I do. I want to do a quick, quick, quick follow up just on that. So the ones that people are making at home and selling them are those like semi effective. I know you said anything is better, but is it like, are they effective to a certain degree? Yeah. I guess? Yeah. So, you know, if you really want to sort of boost the efficacy of your mask, there are a couple of simple things that you can do. There's some research to suggest that actually just simply um, uh, paper towels are good filter. So I've been sort of just like folding up a, a paper towel and putting it on the inside of the cloth masks that I have so that I'm reserving the surgical masks and the N95 masks for sort of clinical settings when I'm just out and about in the world. I just use a regular old 
cloth face covering. Um, but if I'm, you know, going to the grocery store or someplace where I'm going to be inside and around a lot of people, I'll just fold up a paper towel and put it on the inside. There are all types of sort of HEPA filters and fancy filters. You can also buy those and insert those into your cloth masks as well. Um, but again, I, you know, I, I encourage people that like, even if you can't do that, at least do something, right? Like at right. least put a bandana on, at least put something on your face. Um, because that would go a long way if everyone just did that for four weeks. Uh, Dr. Reagan, we could sit here and <laughs> I mean, there's like so many questions, so many more questions I would love to ask. Uh, but I know that we're running out of time. We want to thank you for being here and just sharing your knowledge, dropping the wisdom. I'm, I'm sure that it helps so many people because we just don't know. I mean, you helped me. I definitely wasn't doing all of that with my mask, my regular mask that I was wearing on an everyday basis. So um, we just want to thank you for coming on the show and sharing your time and your wisdom. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was such a pleasure. And just thank you for all of the work that you do to create black people to talk about important issues. Thank you, thank you. All right, so everybody, before we go and we, we get on out of here, um, I wanna just do our BPS person of the week. So our BPS person of the week is Jasmine Twitty, the youngest person ever to be appointed a judgeship in the United States. A graduate of the College of Charleston, Jasmine was elected as an associate judge to the uh, Easley Municipal Court, South Carolina. In addition to her being a judge at 25, Jasmine is a volunteer at the Urban League of Upstate and is a founding member of Lead Her, a professional development group for women in Upstate Greenville, South Carolina. For your, we want to give you a shout out for your continued strive for excellence and your commitment to justice and social change. Jasmine Twitter, you are our BPS person of the week. We have about three more minutes left. And I just think she is the bomb diggity for uh, being a judge at 25. And forgive me, because there was a commercial on TV about this black man who started off looking like a regular guy and get ready to get stopped by the police. And then he gets up on the judge. You know, he gets up on the, on the uh, what do you call it? The what, what would the judge thing be called? The little desk that he's on. What, what, would, you, what would you call it? Podium? I don't Podium. know. Oh, yeah. We're all like, there's no way he could be a judge. He looks too young, but she just proved me wrong. So I'm appreciative. Is there anything you guys want to say before we uh, jump out of here, Janora? Uh, absolutely. Uh, first, I wanted to make sure that uh, Reagan shared her or Tim was able to share Reagan's Twitter address so folks can shout her out, ask her any other questions, reach out, give love, uh, get information we'll put that at the bottom of the screen. And then the other thing I would just like to share going back to my full disclosure and then my sense of appreciation, Reagan, Dr. Reagan was my roommate, my freshman and sophomore year at Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> I told y'all I am blessed with uh, just amazing black girl magic, just all parts of my life. So I'm so grateful to you, Reagan, for, for right, all right. That, that you do. And I'm also grateful for all those folks from back home in North Carolina, tuning in, sharing love, asking questions. Uh, Shalanda, Shauna, uh, Tori, Kendra, Tanika, like everybody. I felt like we had a village and a tribe on here. Monica, if I didn't shout you out, like everybody. Thank you. We love you. We feel the love. And uh, thank you again, Reagan, for all that you shared today. Very important knowledge and conversation. Thank each of you so much. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, uh, Abdul, did you have anything? We got like, I don't know, 30 seconds. <laughs> I think it's called a bench when they say come to the yeah. bench. Somebody, bench. Somebody, bench. That's what it was. Uh, somebody <laughs> said it for me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate and it. Shalanda is a, uh, a judge, just was appointed a juvenile judge in Fulton County in Georgia. Woo! Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so she would know. <laughs> all right. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you for all you wonderful, beautiful people for chiming in every single week. We really appreciate it. Definitely go to Twitter, Dr. Reagan on Twitter, and we are going to sign out. And uh, yeah, that's all I got to say. Thanks, Jeff, for checking it out. All right, you guys take care. Thanks, everybody. Night. We'll see yeah. you next week. And hey, Jameson, he's my 10-year-old nephew who just chimed in, and I'd be in trouble if I didn't shout him out. 
So oh, anybody thanks, else? everybody. <laughs> there you go. All right.